All right, everyone. We are going to keep going with our uh, class dealing with discoveries that validate the Bible. And uh, I see a couple of batteries. I will run out, I just wanna make sure. So, this is uh, some, some neat stuff that, uh, you know, you look at um, spiritual matters, and I think today in our world, we've, we have this, this tendency to sort of expect things that have this kind of a scientific basis. And, and that's, I think, what you see with um, like TV shows, like popularity, um, at least, at least since maybe like the 2000s uh, of, of certain television programs, it's often been those that have some kind of scientific basis or deal with some kind of scientific evidence. So you'll see CSI, and I don't know how there's like four or five of those, you know, and um, you know uh, NCIS and all of these bunch of other letter named you know, shows. Um, but uh, but you but you see that, and there seems like this emphasis. Uh, on scientific data and then we turn to religion and it's like oh well that has no scientific data right there's 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 no evidence for that it's just stuff that somebody in the bronze age made up and that's actually not true because when you look at the bible you know there's this this emphasis in scripture on uh it being historical and there's so much of the bible that is historically oriented and so you know you look at um, different, uh, different parts of the Old Testament in particular. And, you know, such and such, you know, was, was here or there, you know, this town or this, this custom happens and it still occurs to this day. And you see phrases like that that are used over and over again. And what it does is it sort of paints this picture for us that the Bible is actually rooted in history, right? It's, it's, it's grounded in fact. And I think a lot of people, when we look at um, religions, we don't, we don't quite get that. And then, and, then, and then you get into some that are like, especially those that are like the science fiction religions. I mean, I don't mean like, you know, the Jedi and Star Wars. I mean like real science fiction religions like Scientology, where, um, of course, you know that, uh, I guess for this crowd, you, you know, like the, the two biggest proponents of that have been, you know, John Travolta and Tom Cruise. I think John Travolta's tried to distance himself from it, uh, but... Uh, um, has maybe done a little bit of that. Tom Cruise is, is all in on it, and that's very clear. I mean, if you know anything about that dude, it's like, okay, Top Gun, yes. Scientology, also yes. Right? Those are like the two like, most important things about Tom Cruise. Um, but, uh, but, I mean, it, it was literally invented by L. Ron Hubbard, who was a science fiction writer. Uh, he, he wrote pulp science fiction, and it's, he supposedly said the the quickest way to make a million dollars is to go and is to create a religion, and then, so he did it. And uh, I mean, they've got money for days, and of course, they've got Hollywood stars, and then some people who've who've tried to come out of it, like uh, um, who is it? Leah Remini. Leah Re Remini is that her name? Yeah, she used to play on some like I think King of Queens was a TV show she was on, but she's come out and I think has a couple of documentaries now. Uh, on it. It's called, like, and she wrote a book, I think, called Going Clear, uh, where she talked about her journey out of Scientology, and, and it's, um, uh, it is a just strange thing, you know, when you, when you actually get into it. It's like, you know, you go read Dianetics, and I remember when I was a kid, you, Dianetics was all over, you know, infomercials, you know, oh, it'll help you live a better life, and, you know, you, you can see the picture, right, the kind of the reddish cover, L. Ron Hubbard, and, um, uh, but if you get into it, I mean, there's a whole, there, I mean, there's a whole science fiction mythology to it. You know, well, you know, there is this, you know, this giant space battles and these, you know, space uh, lords of the universe, and they, you know, detonated this atomic bomb, and, and all these souls that were killed, well, they all sort of can collect on you, and, and so you have to be, you know, freed of these, these strange sort of nomadic spiritual beings that can, that can adhere to you, and of course, it's a process called auditing. And uh, when, you, when you look at how important money is to this group, it's like that was appropriately named, <laughs> you know, using those financial terms to describe religious principles, yes. Um, but, you know, you look at stuff like that, and it's like, this is, this is strange. I mean, how do people actually believe this stuff, you know? 
And, um, and so you, then you turn and you look at the Bible and you're like, is that really any different? Right? Is it, I mean, it's, it's religion, it's spiritual stuff. I mean, is it really that different? And the thing is, when you go back and you see just how many times you can find names of people and places in the Bible mentioned outside of the Bible, in the right times, in the right places, that lets you know that the Bible is different. You know, I mean, you, you, you can look, and, and there have been excavations in Jerusalem, and they've, they've discovered, you know, seals of, of people's, with people's names on it. Because, you know, when you, when you did a, a, a document, you would wrap it up, you'd roll it up into a little scroll, and you'd tie a string around it, and you'd put some little clay on it, and you have a seal, and you stamp it. They found seals of people in the Bible, you know, in excavations. So that's, you know, exciting stuff, because it lets you know, oh, well, this person mentioned in Chronicles, or this person mentioned in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, yeah, that was a real guy. We've got evidence of, of, of his existence that was discovered by professional scholars, you know? So it's, it's, it's really exciting stuff when you, when you think about that kind of thing. The thing is, when you go back farther, like in the New Testament, we've got some things, and we'll talk about some New Testament stuff as well. We're not just going to stay on, on Old Testament artifacts. We'll talk about some New Testament uh, things. And, you know, you've got uh, inscriptions that mention people who appear in the book of Acts, governors, you know, uh, people like Pilate, people, there's a guy named Gallio uh, in, uh, mentioned in Acts. And you will look at one of, uh, something that he, that he wrote uh, that, that we have. And so it really is pretty exciting to see that. But the thing is, the farther back you go, the less is available because stuff just sort of, you know, I mean, it disintegrates over time. You know, you, you watch a, a documentary on Pompeii and you get really spoiled. You think that's how archaeology works because, you know, when Vesuvius erupted in AD 79, you know, it sort of just dumps all this volcanic material on top of these towns. Herculaneum was one, Pompeii was another, there were a couple of others. But, uh, but it sort of created like this snapshot in time. And today, I mean, you can walk the streets of, of Pompeii and, and, and you can see, you know, houses and, and, and go inside the houses, and it looks just like it did 2,000 years ago. You know, little pictures that people painted on the wall of the homeowners, you know, called frescoes. Uh, and, and so you see scenes of, of banquets and feasts and, and, the, and the homeowner, seemingly the homeowners themselves and, and other things like that. And it's like, it's like wow. This How is that? Okay. So you see, um, uh, you know, Vesuvius sort of, sort of froze everything. And, uh, you know, to the, to, the, uh, to the extent that, you know, uh, scholars have been able to go into houses and see bread sitting on the table. And the bread was carbonized. And so it's like a little bread mummy, you know, <laughs> of, of what the bread used to, or, or, or like a baker's uh, shop. And, and, and there's just little loaves of bread that were carbonized. You know, they're, of course, totally inedible now. Um, but, but you can see that like the, they're, they're perfectly preserved, the same shape that they were in 2,000 years ago, just after they were baked, you know? And so you look at that kind of stuff, and you're like, oh, so that's how archaeology works. And it's like, that was really a very rare exception. You know, it really doesn't work that way. Uh, there's a lot more interpretation that goes into it, and sometimes the evidence isn't quite what we want. Now, uh, this morning we're going to talk about the Tel Dan inscription, and this is one of those things where, you know, we're looking at David. This is a, a reference to David, King David, and of course, uh, if you watch a, a TV show or a documentary on this, it'll say, well, you know, lots of scholars think that David was no more historical than King Arthur. You know, maybe, maybe there was some guy, maybe, but he certainly wasn't, he didn't, certainly didn't look anything like the biblical portrait. And, you know, that's one opinion, that's one view that's out there. But the thing is, if the Bible's right, then it's right. And what you find is there's actually evidence that's, that supports the, the biblical picture. So we're going to go to the city of Dan, uh, which is what Tel Dan, that's the name of it. Now, a tell is a mound. And so what would happen over time is people would tend to settle in the same places. So, uh, you know, maybe you've got a source of um, water, 
a river or something, a, you know, or lake, um, or you would have a, a trade route that would go through a certain area. And so there was a reason why that town was there to begin with. Okay? There, was, there was trade, there was water, there were some, you know, maybe mines for iron or copper or something like that, stone. And so there was a reason why they were there. And then, you know, something would happen and the city would be abandoned or it would be destroyed by enemies. Well, that location is still an attractive location, so more people would move in, and they would go to the same place. <clears throat> and so they would build on top of that. And so what happens over time when you have a tell or a mound, it's, it's like the layers of a cake. And so, you know, you've got one layer, and that was, you know, maybe back in 2000 BC, and you've got that, you know, they, they were destroyed or they moved somewhere else or something happened, and then, you know, another people will come in around 1600 BC, and they build on top of that, and then somebody else in the 1200s, and then maybe in the 400s. And so, you have these layers that build up over time, and that's what a tell is. So Tel Dan is the biblical city of Dan in this sort of mound that's been, that's been created there. Now, we've, uh, archaeologists have excavated this, and there's lots of really neat things. So uh, there's a gate here that dates to about the time of Abraham. You know, so when Abraham is, is going through his journeys, it's a definite... Uh, possibility, if not a pretty good likelihood, Abraham saw or went through this gate. Now it's been kind of blocked up. You can kind of see, you can sort of see the arch there, and then it's been sort of blocked up uh, in, in the in the arch itself. But Abraham could have walked through this. You know, that, that's that's really really neat stuff to think. You know, there's a there's a biblical character, and 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 you get this sense in Jerusalem a lot because if you go to like. The, uh, the, 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 the western wall, there is a place in, in the tunnels that go underneath um, the western wall that the pavement is very likely the pavement that Jesus and the disciples walked on. And it is absolutely um, surreal. It's fascinating to say, you know, I'm standing in a spot where, you know, Jesus and Peter and James and John and all the rest they, they, they walked on this same path of stones that I'm walking on 2,000 years later. Right? It's, it's neat. Um, so, you know, Abraham saw this or, or went through it. Um, unfortunately, the city of Dan, it, uh, people in Israel didn't always stay faithful to the covenants. I know, you know, if you know anything about the book of Judges, this is very clear. Uh, they, uh, they had a habit of, of going after false gods. And this is an example from the, from the Old Testament period where, you know, you have this shrine uh, that was at different places. You had a lot of these in the city of Dan. And so you see these little five stones here, right here at the very, very bottom. Well, that makes up a little shrine. And what you would do is you would go put your little offering. You know, you, you're coming into town or going out of town or doing something, have some kind of business. And so you walk past this little shrine and you leave a little offering there. For these gods and the five stones represented different gods of the canaanites now this is a dan right this is in a biblical city but if you remember people from the tribe of dan at the end of the book of judges if you remember that they're not so good <laughs> i mean these were these are guys who were who were i mean i mean we use the word rascal and, and we use that as sort of an affectionate term but uh i would maybe prefer more along the lines of Maybe not all the way to villain, but these were not these were not faithful Israelites. These were people who were absolutely um, a pagan in, in their outlook. Shouldn't have been, but they were. And you know, you've got evidence of, of their activities here with shrines like this. Uh, you've got a high place <clears throat> at the city of Dan, and what this is a high what a high place was was it was generally sort of higher up, which is why they call it a high place. Right? Again, archaeologists are not very creative uh, with naming things, but it's, it's sort of higher up. Now, now, it wasn't always the highest part, but it was elevated because you thought that you were getting closer to the gods, right? It's kind of like, you know, you, you, um, uh, you, you, you yell at your kids or you yell for your kids or try to tell them something. You're like, what? You know, from upstairs. So what do you do? You go get to the, at the foot of the stairs. And then if they can't hear you from the foot of the stairs, then it gets really irritating, Right? So what, what you, so you get closer, right? It's a human thing. You get closer if you can't hear somebody. 
uh, you, to either, either to talk to them or listen to them what they're saying. And I guess there was a similar principle here that worked with the gods because, you know, you, you get to a little bit of a higher elevation, maybe the gods can you know, have an easier time hearing you because, you know, the gods are people too. And so, uh, so that's what happened. Well, uh, this is, uh, it, was, it was destroyed. And what this iron structure here is, you see this, it has this sort of cube or, or, or rectangular or a square shape. And it's got these little, these little uh, things on the, each corner. That's what's called a horned altar. And so they, they, they reconstructed, mo modern uh, scholars reconstructed what the, whole, what the altar would have looked like back in ancient times because the stones are no longer there. There's, there's very little of this there. So uh, that's what a horned altar looked like. And you know, there's lots of examples uh, of this uh, that archaeologists have found. And before they found it, you know, they didn't really know what it looked like. And so they would, they would draw a picture of a little, you know, some stones with like big elephant tusks coming off of it because nobody knew what it, what it was. But they found examples of it. And so it's just these, these, these altars that have, you know, these, these sort of little um, horn-shaped stone protrusions at, at the corners. And this is a major, major place of worship at the city of Dan. And kind of gives you a little bit of an insight into where the Israelites were at this time in Israelite history. You know, they're completely comfortable with having this kind of stuff, even though this violates the Mosaic law, right? Because first of all, you're not building altars to other gods because other gods don't exist. You don't have any idols to those. There was a place where an idol would have gone uh, nearby, just, to, just, you know, 20, 30 feet away from this. You also don't build altars out of shaped stones. You know, Exodus chapter 20, that's a big no-no. And so... You know, this, all of this violates the Mosaic Law in all kinds of ways, but they'd gotten comfortable with that. And I think there's a lesson there for us, is, is you know, when, 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 when God brings the people of Israel into Canaan, you know, he, he, he's taking them out of Egypt, but it was a lot easier to get Israel out of Egypt than it was to get Egypt out of Israel, right? Because they're still doing all this false pagan stuff, worshiping false gods, and when they get to Canaan, and this is, this is a, a kind of a, I guess what you'd call a cautionary tale for Christians. Be very, very careful of letting the culture influence you and your spiritual outlook. Um, I mean, there are all, in fact, I, I, I referenced last week um, a fellow who's the, the TikTok preacher. He does videos on, on the TikTok platform. And um, it blows my mind how many followers this guy has and how influential he is and how badly he distorts the Bible. I mean, he, I've, I've seen him explain texts that to me, I'm, is, am I talking to a, to a six-year-old? How do you get this interpretation out of the Bible? But what, it ha what happens is, you bring stuff with you to, to the Bible when you read it. And so you have like these glasses that you put on. And so you start reading things into the Bible that aren't there. And this fellow is, you know, very, very pro-LGBTQ plus, you know, all the other letters that go on the end of that. Um, he is extraordinarily progressive, universalist, nobody's going to hell, there's no such thing as hell. You know, he, he's bringing all this stuff to the Bible and reading it into the Bible. And in ancient Israel, I can see something similar happening. Oh, well, we know the gods operate this way. We know the gods have high places, and they have altars that look like this, and they have sacrifices that look like that. And these are the stories that the, our neighbors tell about those gods. And so we're going to see God kind of the same way. And the thing is, that didn't stop with ancient Israel, and it didn't stop with the early church. It's still going on today. There's still so much of our culture where people will say things like, oh, well, we know God is like this, or we know God is like this, or we know this is how spirituality works, or this is how church should look like, or this is what you should accept when it comes to biblical teaching because there's all other different kinds of viewpoints and they're all equally true. People are still doing that stuff. And it is no more acceptable now than it was then, or at any, at any other point in, in, in the history of God's people, right? But the culture will do this. The culture will, 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 um, will, will press us on this. Um, when we look at the life of David, uh, we see that he had a variety of enemies that he fought. Goliath was one, of course, but then you've also got the Philistines. And this is another one of those places where the Bible gets everything right. 
right? It, it, it gets the Philistines right, where they are, what they do, what they look like, how they operate. And this is a picture <clears throat> of some Philistines fighting the Egyptians. Uh, this, is, this is from Egypt, and here's a colorized version of that picture. And so you've got, uh, if you look really, if, if, you can, if you can make it out, if you look really closely, like um, here's a Philistine boat right here. You can tell because of their, the stuff they wear on their head. Uh, here is an Egyptian boat down here at the bottom. You can tell because of their equipment. And, the, what, and what the Philistines looked like were something like this. this. These are pictures of the Philistines that are being carried off by Egyptians as, as, as prisoners of war. And if you've ever seen a, like a reenactment of, you know, Life of David or, or something like that, you know, um, you'll, you'll often see the Philistines have this kind of feathered sort of headgear that they wear. And it's based off of actual pictures of Philistines that we find in ancient Egypt. And so um, scholars don't know exactly what these are. It could be strips of leather, it could be feathers. Don't really know what it is uh, because it doesn't really say, it just depicts it, right? And that's, and that's the closest guess. But, you know, that's a good enough um, suggestion. But that's what they look like. Right? The, the, these are what the guys look like. They were shaved, right? So if you see a picture of Goliath with the big bushy beard, uh, that is not historically accurate. Right? It's modern-day Hollywood uh, because the Philistines were Greeks. They, they came from the area of Greece, and so they, they were clean-shaven. Uh, they didn't have beards or mustaches. Uh, and then had this you know, other di uh, distinctive equipment that they would wear. Um, when David conquers Jerusalem... It's kind of a small city. Uh, it, was, it was pretty small for a capital city in the ancient world. Um, but when you look at the city of, of Jerusalem today, uh, of course, it's still important. You know, this, this is the city. David, this was not his city starting out. He goes and he conquers it. He, all right, he goes up this, uh, what seems to be a water shaft that, that we, we know where that's located, right? And so the, the fascinating thing about this is if you go to the books of 1 Samuel, you could actually get geographical details, and you can go to that spot today. You know, scholars think they know where uh, this, this kind of water shaft is that the Israelites snuck into the city of Jerusalem to conquer it and, and take it over from the Jebusites, right? You can go into that water shaft today. Uh, I, don't know if you, I don't know if they still let you climb it. I had a picture of a professor who had a rope, and he, would, he was being lowered or raised one or the other through this through this water shaft. I think they don't let you do that anymore, probably for insurance purposes, uh, because that's, that's the world we live in, right? Um, but uh, but you, know, you can find that. And I know I've mentioned a reference here in, in, a, in a sermon one time about a, um, in World War II, there was, a, there was a, a particular pass. I think Jonathan goes through it, and he, he takes out this, this Philistine garrison uh, of troops. And there was an actual story in World War II that... Um, uh, the Allies were, were looking to overtake this, this German position. And this guy actually turned to the Bible, remembered the story, they followed the same course of action, and they defeated the Germans. <laughs> right? So, uh, I mean, I mean it's, it's that accurate. It, it, it's, it's that close when it comes to providing details that you know, are real time and space. You know? uh, now, Jerusalem is, uh, again, was, was David's uh, city. It's quite a bit bigger, right? The Temple Mount is a lot bigger than it was when, David, when, when uh, Solomon was working on it. But um, it probably looks something like that. Now, this is looking north, okay? This is, it. This is if you're standing at the south end of uh, right around where the Temple Mount is and you're looking north, this is what it sort of would have looked like. This is a reconstruction of what it looked like in the ancient world. And so... Um, in, uh, in, in where the Temple Mount is, it doesn't, it's not quite perfectly oriented north. It's kind of tilted just a, just a little bit, but there is a, a, a bit of land that makes sort of a, it's called the Spur or the Ophel. And so you're looking at that right here. It's kind of in the foreground where it's sort of, it's sort of uh, blurry, but you're looking at that, at that spur of land, right? Sort of, sort of this wedge-shaped uh, bit of land there. And on the uh, right-hand side, that's the Kidron Valley, which isn't much of a valley. If you look at it today, it just sort of looks like a little, you know, uh, dip in the land, uh, probably because it's, it's been built up over time. But, you know, that's, that's the, the valley when the, when the, when the uh, priests and the mob is coming to get Jesus. 
when they're coming to get Jesus, they have to go across that valley to go up to the temple or to the, uh, the Mount of Olives, which is, which would be right over, I guess if you had a, like a big picture, it'd be sort of like right over in this area uh, over here in terms of the landscape. So that valley is where the priests actually traveled across to go get Jesus. Uh, but this is a thousand years before that, right? So, you, so you've got this little bit of land. You've got the city of David, which is right here. And then you've got the Temple Mount, which is up here. Of course, Solomon works on that, and Herod expands it. But, uh, but that's what the city looked like when, uh, when David was king. And there's, a, there's actually something called the, it's called the stepstone structure today. And it's sort of a retaining wall, and scholars think that at the top of this retaining wall, uh, would have been up here, was David's palace. Now, you remember the story about him spying on Bathsheba? It's really easy to see that here because his palace is up high, and, and we always think, wow, that was weird. I mean, how did David, how, how did he contort, or, or, or what did he have to do to, to actually look into somebody's window? That's kind of odd. But the thing is, you know, Bathsheba's bathing on her roof, and you've got a palace that sits up high, and her house is a little down low, a bit down lower. All David has to do is look off the edge. And, and, and today, if, if you go down to the bottom uh, of where this stepstone structure is, you can look, you know, I guess it may be five or six stories, you can look straight up in the air to the top of it, uh, completely unhindered. No, no trees, no vegetation, nothing like that. It would have just been city in the ancient world. So David is, is looking just you know, kind of surveying all of his, his, his city and looking at, at this magnificent little place that he has. It's now the capital of his kingdom. And all he has to do is do this. And there she is. <laughs> it's that easy, right? But sin, very often, is that easy. It's easy to get into. It's a lot harder to get out of, as, uh, as David found out uh, in that whole affair. Well, when we talk about the historicity of David... We've got a several things that we, that we um, several objections that people sometimes use. And one is the Bible can't be used as a source. Uh, it's, this is extremely biased, right? Because if you just look at the Bible as a piece of literature, why wouldn't you use it? It's just a book written out of the ancient world. Why wouldn't you use it? I mean, there's all kinds of sources like that. Why is it that you're discriminating against the Bible? You know, so it, it's, it's, it's unfair and it's, it's, un, and it's not unbiased. David didn't leave behind any monuments or inscriptions that we know of or that we have found, right? Because we haven't found anything yet. And that's the operating word, is yet. Because archaeology is always digging stuff up, right? Uh, now, you've got a lot of other reasons why that might be the case. One of the, one of the things might be that Maybe David did leave something behind, but as people sometimes did in the ancient world, a new king comes on the throne, doesn't like David, chisels his name out of stuff. They did that in Egypt all the time. That's actually why King Tut had his tomb discovered, because King Tut was thought to be a heretic or was connected to a heretic. And so they chiseled his name out of everything. And so when tomb robbers went to go rob the tombs of all the pharaohs, King Tut's name was missing. So they didn't know his tomb was there. So they missed it. So, you know, that kind of stuff happens. Uh, but, you know, David's name could have been chiseled out. They could have had inscriptions destroyed. I mean, there was a lot of stuff that went on. Jerusalem's been, been torn up a lot in its history. Uh, it's been destroyed a number of times, rebuilt a number of times. Uh, so there's reasons why that kind of information may not exist. Uh, Jerusalem was too small. It, we want, we're not going to get into that one, but there's a reason why that's sort of a ridiculous um, argument. But then the very last one, what we're going to talk about today, is David's name is not recorded in other sources. And that's where we get into the Tel Dan inscription. And so you've got this, this piece of, uh, of, of, a, of a monument. And last week we talked about the Mernetha Stila. Right? And I said a Stila was a stone monument that had sort of an inscription on it. Uh, they don't always have inscriptions, but they usually do. And it was usually something where it was a victory. So, you know, I, king, so-and-so of somewhere, you know, in all of my might and glory and splendor, I devastated all of my enemies and reduced them to nothing. And, you know, they cowered and screamed, and I heard the lamentations of their women, you know, and all that. And so, uh, you, so those are the kind of things that you, that you deal with when you look at these kinds of inscriptions. Uh, I mean, it's worse than any American politician. <laughs> you know, I mean, American politicians are bad for taking credit for what other people do, but these guys, I mean, they had it perfected to an art. 
Um, but uh, but you, you look at this, and it actually does mention the name of David, and it's right here. It's this little, it's this little um, uh, bit here that's, that's sort of, in, it's like chalk or something that's been put into the letters, and it's right there. Uh, it's called the House of David, and sometimes it's, this is called the House of David inscription uh, because of that, because uh, in the book of 2 Kings, there are um, occasionally the kings of Israel and Judah cooperated. A lot of times they didn't, right, because they are, they're basically at odds with each other for a lot of their history. Sometimes they, they teamed up with other nations against each other, and so you've got all kinds of, uh, of, of infighting that goes on there. But there's one, uh, one little bit here where there, it seems that there's a, a king of Damascus named Hazael, and he seems to be the guy who created this inscription, and he's bragging about something. And so the, 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 the original is on the top here, and you've got some places where there's these little X's in brackets. That's places where the, the inscription has been damaged. And we don't know what it said. Either the letters are, are damaged or they're just missing, right? So, so if you go back, there's like places where, you know, I mean, I mean the inscription went, went all the way across. And so you've got these places where it's broken and you've just got some things missing, right? Sometimes that happens. But you, um, but you look at this and where all the X's in brackets are, that has to be reconstructed. Now, what fits is him saying, I killed Jehoram, son of Ahab, king of Israel, and I killed Aziah, uh, Aziahu, son of Joram, king of the house of David. Okay, so um, Jehoram and Ahaziah uh, is what we, we say in English. Uh, these two kings, one of the northern kingdom, one of the southern kingdom, he's killed these guys. Now, what I mentioned a minute ago is politicians taking credit for things they didn't do. If you go back to 2 Kings 9, you actually see he didn't do this. He didn't actually accomplish this, right? So, and some of you, I, I think, you know the Bible very well, you know, know who, it, who it was. And it was Jehu, right? Jehu, who was a um, interesting character, I guess. I mean, interesting as far as politicians go. I'm not trying, I'm not trying to be too hard on politicians today, but it just kind of works. Um, but you, uh, you see that, uh, that Jehu actually does it, right? He takes credit for it. Or, 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 or the Bible says that he's the one who, who does this. Uh, Hazael of Damascus just takes credit for it. Right? I, I killed this guy and I killed this other guy and you know, I've, I've, I've you know, ruined these people and, and now I've, I've, I'm, I'm victorious over them. Now the thing is, <clears throat> um, when you say there's no evidence of David, there actually is. This is, this is a reference to his dynasty. And so when it talks about the house of David, what it's talking about is uh, this is a, the, the dynasty. And, and I, I think I probably have mentioned this in here before, but it's kind of like we, we do something similar in, um, uh, in, in English with monarchies. So, you know, if you go to, you know, the Queen of England today, she's Queen of, of England. It's the house of Tudor? Is that what it is? Windsor. Windsor. Tudor was the previous one. Okay, so... Um, you know, and then you've got the House of Hanover and then and the others who were, who were before that. But you have these dynasties, right? And dynasties change um, uh, from, from time to time. And so, so you have this, well, the House of so-and-so. And we still continue that tradition, but they did the same thing in the ancient world. And what happened was they would have a, um, they would say the House of so-and-so and it was a really well-known king or a noteworthy king, usually the first king in the dynasty, right? And so when we go to Scripture, who's the first king of the dynasty? David, David right? Well, you, you, had, you had the first one, which was Saul, and it was only like a, kind of like a one-shot deal with him. Um, too bad, but, you know, you have David, and David comes along, and he he's the, founds the Davidic dynasty, and then you've got a king from the house of David who's on the throne from that point on. Uh, we still do, right? <laughs> you still have that in Jesus, right? The king of the house of David. And, and so when God you know, comes to David and, and gives him this deal, you know, you stay faithful to me, I will bless you, you know, you'll never lack a man on the throne of Israel. Well, in a sense, that's true, right? We're still living, we're still living under those prom that promise because Christ is still king. He was 
king of the house of David, right? And he's still there. He's still on his throne today, right? Um, so so you, you have that. And, that. and that's one of those, those really marvelous things where like archaeology and prophecy and your covenant and Christianity all sort of come together. But, um, uh, but, but this is a reference to David as being the founder of this dynasty and the kings who followed after him are part of that family. And what sort of frustrates me a little bit well, actually a lot, about this, is, you know, you have modern scholars who come along, and this is a common thing, right? We, we see this all the time, where people living today think that we are so much more enlightened and better off and more advanced than people who came before us, because we are more technologically advanced. And, you know, when I, when I think of that, I think about a book, and I don't know if anyone in here has read it, the book is called Alas, Babylon. Has anybody read that? I want to say it was written in 1951, and it was a story about what would happen. And, of course, this was, you know, nu- nuclear, you know, nuclear uh, war had begun, right? And, and, and we now had nuclear capabilities, destruction on a massive scale that no one had ever seen before. And so, you know, you, you go from, like, the 50s and on into especially the 80s and early 90s, and there was, like, this nuclear craze, Right? People were terrified. What would happen if somebody gets a nuclear bomb? Or you know, what happens if nuclear missiles get fired from Russia or the U.S.? And, and even today, you know, what happens if somebody puts a, uh, is able to compact a nuclear weapon into something the size of a briefcase? Right? In, in, a, in a way, we're still sort of living under that. But um, in this story, there is an event that happens, and it touches off nuclear war between the U.S. and Russia. And there is a nuclear exchange, and, uh, and, and the book follows this, uh, this family, and, and there's some survivors, and they're having to sort of make it on their own, right? They're, they're you know, water out, electricity out. Uh, you know, maybe you go loot the grocery store, but after that's gone, you're done with canned food. You're done with supplies. You know, you have to survive off the land. And because the, the characters in the story had been brought up in this... Um, uh, in this family where, you know, uh, being able to sort of, we would call it live off the grid. I mean, they didn't have, I don't think they had that term in the 50s. Um, but, but the story followed this family who was able to do that. And, 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 they, and they would sort of went back to their um, uh, childhood when they were taught to you know, do camping and, and survivalist kind of type of activities like that. And they could live. And, you know, I, I think about that book because every time somebody says, oh, we're so much more advanced today. We're so much better off today. We're so much more enlightened today. And I think, let's say that scenario happens. Heaven forbid, there's a nuclear exchange. How many of us are gonna make it more than two weeks in this country? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I was in the Boy Scouts, but you know, I despised camping, right? So I, I didn't get anything out of that. You know, I'm not making it, you know? Uh, and so, how, but, but for real, how many of us could do that? You know, and, and then I look at, um, you know, people today and academically, we, we look at um, uh, political figures today versus political figures from 200 years ago, the 1700s. I mean, those, I mean, today people are lawyers, right? In the 1700s, statesmen, and they, were, they weren't politicians, they were statesmen. They read philosophy. They read the writings of ancient Greeks and Romans. They read the writings of you know, great philosophers in, in, in Europe uh, in, in the medieval period and the Renaissance and Reformation. These were people who were thinkers, not just pencil pushers or lawyers, but people who, who had a deeper, more philosophical view of life. And I would say there are a lot of folks today, and I'm not trying to be a jerk when I say this, but I think there are a lot of folks today who are elected to public office that if you were to put them up against a Ben Franklin, or Thomas Jefferson, or James Madison, or, or one of these other guys, um, I'm sorry, there's, there's no competition there. You know, and so we say, ah, oh, well, just because I've got, I've got a handheld computer, basically, right, in my phone, what does that actually do you? <laughs> you know, how does that make you more in line? How does that make you better? How does that make you a deeper thinker? You know, um, there, there's, there's so much of an illusion about that. And so when people say, ah, oh, but, you know, we're, we're so much more advanced today. We, we know so much more. I'm like, yeah, but these guys, 
these guys understood that David was a historical person. These guys interacted with the monarchs that were part of his dynasty, part of his family. These guys understood the historical reality of David. And then you're going to come along 3,000 years later, and because you've got an iPhone, you know more than people who interacted with the actual people themselves 3,000 years ago? So that, so that to me, I mean, I understand I sort of operate in that world a little bit, but it always uh, makes me laugh when I think about that kind of thing because it is what is called, and I think C.S. Lewis was the one who coined this phrase, chronological snobbery. Just because we have the latest and greatest, we think that we're naturally smarter or better than somebody else. And we're looking at artifacts inscribed by people who knew David's family. And we're going to say that we know more than them? 3,000 years removed? So anyway, that's, that's, that's one, of my, one of my little pet peeves that I have from time to time. But uh, anyway, uh, that's the, that's the Tel Dan inscription. So when you look at something like this, this is actual tangible evidence of the reality of the, uh, I guess what you call the sweet psalmist, king of Israel, right? And so little things like that, I think, are, are, are huge helps to us in making sure that you know, we know that our faith isn't something somebody made up 3,000 years ago. It isn't something that somebody just, well, I've, I've got this idea about God, or I have something that I want to, to say, and, and, and some, some feeling about a religious thing. We're actually going back to a biblical text inspired by God who really worked in real time and space with people who really lived in real places. So that, to me, is, is, one, of the, is one of the neatest benefits of, of doing something like this, to know that, you know, in the dark of the night, when... When doubts come, the loss of a loved one, right? Some you know, individual tragedy or, or, or personal difficulty or prolonged trial that you're having to go through. And it's at those moments where the devil comes after you and you have that moment of doubt. It's things like this that let you know that whatever doubts you have, it's the doubt that is illegitimate. It's the doubt that is unreasonable. It's not your faith. Too many people in our world get that the other way around. All right. I think the bell's about to ring. Thank you all so much.
Good morning. Good morning, church family. If you would, come on in and have a seat. Before we get started with worship, we do want to go through some announcements. So glad to see all of you here this morning. I want to uh, say Happy Father's Day to all of our fathers uh, that are in attendance and that are uh, maybe viewing at home. I want to wish you a Happy Father's Day and uh, what a great privilege it is to come and worship uh, our one Father in heaven this morning. We want to uh, remind you that there are uh, attendance cards in the lobby that can be filled out, also the QR code on the back of the pews in front of you. Uh, just a friendly reminder, please silence your cell phone at this time or turn it off. Uh, communion emblems are available in the lobby, and if you forgot one, need one, please raise your hand at this time and, and we can get one to you. Uh, just a reminder also that contribution can be made in various ways. There's a box as you uh, leave the auditorium on the left. Also can be done through PayPal on the church website. And you can also uh, mail a check or, or whatever to the church building or give a contribution to an elder or deacon at any time. There is a staff nursery for ages two and under and also worship training room at the back is uh, available as well as a private uh, mother's room. And if you um, pick up a Sunday bulletin, that'll have uh, more detailed announcements for you. VBS is coming up next Sunday, June 26th through Wednesday, June 29th. If you haven't registered your kids yet, please go ahead and do so. I know that can be done on the uh, NYA, uh, I think family or the members Facebook page, something like that. So. Um, Make sure you register if you're volunteering or if you're uh, sending your kids or have kids to sign up. Uh, they do need donations of packaged cookies and money to purchase refreshments. Uh, cookies may be placed in the kitchen and money may be given to Carolyn Litke. Uh, we do have uh, one announcement regarding uh, the mother of Linda Binion, Essie Sickles, who uh, passed away um, recently. The funeral is going to be at the Blessing Funeral Home in Mansfield. The viewing will be Monday, June 20th from 6 to 8 p.m. And the funeral will be Tuesday, June 21st, beginning at 1 p.m. Please keep Linda and her family in prayers uh, for peace and comfort at this time. Uh, one more announcement regarding VBS upcoming. If you are registered as a VBS volunteer, there will be a meeting this Wednesday at 6 p.m. in the Adult One classroom. And be on the lookout for an email from Kelly Davis. She will be sending one out, contacting all the VBS volunteers. VBS work days will start this Thursday and Friday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And there'll be a work day uh, this next Saturday from 9 to 3. Here at the building, contact Carly Gent Gentry for all the workday information. That's all I've got. Um, before Dwayne comes up, we do have a, a trailer for a VBS, so. All right, guys, thanks for joining me for another STEM Lego building adventure. And now, for the special announcement I promised you guys earlier, we're gonna be holding a STEM Lego building competition right here on this channel. All you have to do is build a Lego boat that floats. And the boat that holds the most paint wins. The winner will receive a shout out on this channel and a STEM Lego Master Builder t-shirt. All right, guys, let's get those brains working and start building. Whoa, wow, you see that? A YouTube Lego competition that I know we can win. That's right, Tim. We may get a couple of kids. Some may even call us cool kids. But we got this competition in the bag. With my knowledge and your Lego sets, we got this. What do you mean, your knowledge? Remember that old Star Wars pirate that I built? Oh, yeah, the one you lost the instructions to, then I had to go online, search up Google for hours to find them, and reprint them just so we could build it. That one? 
who will win the STEM Master Builder competition. Can't wait to see you there. All right, good morning, everyone. It's a wonderful day. It's a day to rejoice in. It's a day that the Lord has made. And, of course, it's a day to celebrate fathers. Uh, and we, of course, get together every Sunday to celebrate the greatest father of all. And that's what we do here every time. Because we, uh, in him, we live and we move and we have our being. Without him, we really aren't anything. But with him, we have everything. So glad to see everyone here this morning. Now we've got a few visitors with us. Thank you so much for being here and uh, participating in our worship here at New York Avenue. We hope you have an uplifting and edifying time. And please don't get away without us getting a chance to say hello to you. But uh, we're going to do that actually a little bit now. So uh, members, let's make our visitors feel welcome.
Please pray with me. Dear God, Father in heaven, we uh, come to you this morning just so thankful for this beautiful morning you've given us to come and worship and praise your name. And as we go through this worship service this morning, uh, please help us uh, to uh, find ways to worship you and praise you uh, like never before, Father. And uh, as Dwayne delivers his lesson this morning, uh, please help him find the words to, uh, to touch our hearts best and to uh, serve your kingdom as best we possibly can. Um, Father, especially we want to lift up the fathers this morning. I uh, want to thank you for all of their guidance and leadership uh, in the families here at, at New York Avenue Church of Christ. And, and Father, more importantly, we want to thank you, like Dwayne said earlier, we want to thank you for from being the ultimate father and for sending your son Jesus to, to give us the kind of role model that, that you want us to be. And uh, we just pray that, that the fathers here uh, continue to, to be more like Jesus and to model his behavior to our families more uh, to better serve your kingdom. Uh, Father, we continue to ask prayers on the uh, elders and deacons of this congregation. Please continue to give them the wisdom and, and knowledge they need uh, to make the tough decisions they have to make uh, here at the congregation um, and be with them as, uh, as they're going through that. Uh, Father, we also ask that you uh, send a big blessing on our vacation Bible school coming up and uh, we ask that uh, that that be an outreach for for our community so that we can better serve you uh, and reach those that, that may not know you as well uh, father as we continue through our worship just please be with us and uh, please help everything uh, be to your glory and your honor and it's in your son's name that we pray amen <clears throat>
When I was attending uh, Heritage Christian University working on my Bible degree, one of my favorite classes was a mission class. And my professor then had been a missionary in Western Africa uh, in the French-speaking uh, area. The French had colonized it. And that's, there's no elephants or tigers or bears there. That's a real wet climate. And so the number one uh, crop for the people out there was rice because it was very wet and damp. And he shared this episode with us. They'd go out there and they'd plant their rice paddy fields. And in the corner, they made this little rice god, fashioned him. And they'd go bury him in the corner of the field. Then at harvest time, if they had a wonderful great harvest of rice, which was going to carry them through the winter, they would dig up the rice god and they would put him up high and they'd carry him through the village and they'd sing the praises of the rice god and have a big, big festival. However, if after burying the rice god they had a bad crop, they would dig up the rice god, go out and get some branches and twigs from the surrounding area, and sit there and beat the rice god. Say, bad god, bad god, bad god. <laughs> and as kind of silly and funny as we think that is, that's not too unlike what our culture and people are like. If God blesses me and gives me what I want, then I'll honor him. I'll make a deal with God. You see it on TV all the time. If I get over this disease, if I get out of this bad situation, well, then I won't cuss and I won't swear and I might even go to church. And even as Christians, we might sit there, well, I'll come to church and take part of the sacrament because, God, you're going to give me good stuff. But it's not about the stuff. Jesus came as we get ready to partake of the Lord's Supper. It's not about the stuff. Yes, God blesses us. But it was in his body that he gave for us that he bore our sins on the tree. 1 Peter 2.24 And he reconciled us to God in the body of his flesh. Colossians 1.22 and it's because we needed that reconciliation with God that Jesus then on the night he was betrayed to make that great sacrifice as recorded in Matthew 26, verse 26. He said, take, eat, this is my body. And as Christians, as we get ready to partake of this, we're told to examine ourselves. So as Paul encouraged the Romans and us through scripture, Romans 12, verse 1, we need to present our bodies just as Christ presented his body on our behalf, present our bodies as a living and holy sacrifice. Let's all bow. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much that our Jesus came and gave his body on the cross to ransom us from our mistakes and our sins. Help us to realize it's not about the stuff, but it's about him and it's about having a relationship with him. It's about having our sins moved out of the way, taken away so that we can be your children. So let each one of us as we examine our life, our body, let us do the things, not just refrain from the bad stuff, not make a deal with you, Father, but present ourselves wholly as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you. We thank you so much for our Jesus. The sacrifice he made, the relationship we have, be your children because of what he did for us. In his name we pray. You know, we learn in the Old Testament many places, just one, Le Leviticus 7, 11, 17, 11. The life of the flesh or the body is in the blood. And we have peace through the blood of the cross, Colossians 1, 20. The blood of Christ cleanses our consciences to serve the living God, as the Hebrew writer noted in Hebrews 9, 14. His blood continues to cleanse us of all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, 7. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 26, 28, that this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for the forgiveness of many. Later on in chapter 3, verse 16, 
of 1 John. We know love by this, that he laid down his life, he shed his blood for us. And we ought to lay down our lives as it were shed our blood for the bread to run. Let's again go to the Heavenly Father in prayer. Dear Father, we thank you so much for the blood, for the life that Jesus gave for us, that we could be redeemed, have our consciences clean, that we could have the opportunity, great opportunity to serve you, that that blood, as we confess our sins on a continual basis, continues to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and keeps us in a right relationship with you and gives us that opportunity to make each day new and fresh because we're forgiven children of yours. Help us to appreciate that great gift and that great sacrifice and to be committed to laying down our lives for one another. Thank you so much for our Jesus and his sacrifice of his blood. In his name we pray. It's not about the stuff. But what do you give to a God who has everything? Who is sufficient? You know, inflation's not hurting him one bit. He doesn't need any of our gifts. Matter of fact, every gift we have, every blessing has come from him. Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4. Because of what Christ has done for us, we are to do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Don't merely look out for your own personal interests, but look out for the interests of others. Aren't we so grateful this morning that our God, through Jesus Christ, looked out for our interests? Because no matter what we accumulated, what stuff we had here, we'd have nothing if it weren't for the sacrifice of Jesus. And so number one, we have the opportunity, like doctors, do no harm. Don't ever hurt a brother in Christ. Don't ever hurt the church. Do nothing for, for selfishness or empty conceit. Be willing to forgive others who sinned against us because our God has and continues to forgive us so much. And second, we can be a part of his mission. We can take the opportunities and the time he gives us to lay down our lives, to shed our life's blood, if it were, for one another, for the brethren, brother. You know, all the stuff that we see around us, that we have to go to work tomorrow, work hard for, to pay the light bill and put food on the table and put shoes on the kids and all that stuff, that didn't cost God anything. Spoken into being like that. But what was important to him, what he spent the most precious thing he had on was people, was his church. And so we have the opportunity to be a part of that mission. To not only do no harm, but to help out. And in doing that, we show that we truly appreciate the sacrifice that God has made for me. My way of saying thank you. What do you give to the God who has everything? What is important to God? You give yourself. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much that no matter what this life has done to us, no matter what we have or don't have, abilities or otherwise, that the most important thing, because of what Jesus did for us, the most important position we'll ever have is that we're your friends, and that we are children of God. Thank you for making us your children. And help us, Father, then, to live our lives in a holy and acceptable way, to lay down our lives for the brethren, for each other, and to reach out so that others can also be called the children of God. Bless the gifts that we give. 
just as a small token that we understand and appreciate what a great God you are and how wonderful you've been to us. Father, it's not about getting stuff. We don't want to make a deal with you today. But as you have given yourself to us, help us to be committed to more perfectly forgive, be generous, and to give ourselves to you, just as our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ did for us. As in his name we pray. Amen. Our gracious Heavenly Father, as always, we are so thankful that you have allowed us to assemble ourselves together that we might be able to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, this morning we want to send up a prayer of thanksgiving. But before we do, Father, we do want to petition a few in our number. Continue to remember the Rogers family, oh Heavenly Father, that you will look down on them and bless them as Friday they laid a good soldier right off to rest. We pray for his family as they grow, go through this process. Father, <clears throat> here at New York Avenue, we are so very thankful that we have the privilege of having him as one of the servants here, serving as an elder. Example, his mentorship, Father, we pray that that will perpetuate itself through this audience to men who may have a desire to be an elder. Father, we pray, continue to pray for our members who have recently lost loved ones and continue to be with them as they face each day. Comfort them 
the only way that you know how, O oh, oh, Heavenly Father. Father, in our prayers, so many times we ask, 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 and you tell us to. You, you instruct us to leave our burdens at your feet. But at this time, Heavenly Father, we want to send up a prayer of thanksgiving for some specific things. First, Father, we're thankful for Christ, who you, the Father of all fathers, gave up to die that each and every one of us might have a right to salvation. Father, we're thankful for salvation, the opportunity to be saved in eternal life. We are obedient to your word. Father, we're thankful for the Holy Spirit, which guides us day in and day out. Help us to follow it. When we stray away, help us to remember that the Holy Spirit is there to guide us in the right direction. Father, so many things we take for granted, our food, our shelter, and our clothing. Father, we're thankful for those things, for there are people around the world who these things don't come so easy. Father, we're thankful for our income that you allow us to earn, whether it's a fixed income or whatever way that we are able to sustain ourselves monetarily, be able to pay our bills, as was mentioned earlier, and buy these clothes and this food and to pay for this shelter over our head. Father, we're so thankful for the ability to be able to go out and earn a living and to give to others and to help others when we have an opportunity to. Father, we're thankful for our family. We are so thankful for the opportunity to be able to, to, to serve as husbands, wives, fathers, mothers, children, grandparents, uncles, and aunts. Father, we pray that we don't take these things for granted. Family is a big thing. Family is the institution that, that fills the church. And Father, we're, we're just so thankful for our families. Father, we're thankful for our health and our strength, the ability, the ability to be able to get up and come and assemble ourselves together. Some of us are struggling with our health and our strength, and Father, we pray that you be with them, that if it be your will, you return them to a reasonable portion of their health and their strength. Father, we're thankful for helping us and navigate through COVID these last two years. It's been tough. On, on this world has been tough in the church. But Father, we have navigated and we continue to navigate. And we're thankful that this congregation, that you helped us stay stable in our offering and, and in other areas as we try to navigate through this, uh, this pandemic. Thank you so much, O oh Heavenly Father. Father, we're thankful for the church, the mechanism by which we are to be saved, family of God. We're thankful for all the members who serve, uh, particularly here at this congregation, in any capacity. Father, we are thankful to have men, women, and children who are willing to do the things that, that there is to be done to, to move this congregation forward and to try to draw more people unto you. Father, this is just a short list of things that we can be thankful for, for there are so many other things that we can be thankful. And Father, this hour, we just wanted to pause and say thank you so much. You do things for us that we don't even know that you're doing. And again, Father, I know we, we, we constantly ask, and we want to continue to ask, like you have instructed us in your word. Father, this hour, we pause to say thank you. Father, we pray for Dwayne as he is going to deliver us the message. Father, we pray for Dwayne and for Krista, Hayden, Ava, Sophia, Corinne, and Olivia. And we're thankful for the time that they have spent with us. It has been edifying and uplifting. We pray for them, Father, as they transition to their new endeavors, that you will be with, be with them and they can be a blessing where they're moving to. Father, we pray that whatever we do in word, thought, or deed, but it's, it's for the sole purpose of winning more souls to you, edifying those saints. Give us of our sins. In your son's name we ask it all.
Good morning, everyone, and happy Father's Day to fathers out there. I know that is a particular role that is, that is important in the life of family and the life of the church, and we're going to be talking about fathers today, and I think I'm going to treat the subject about like I always do. For Mother's Day, we typically celebrate motherhood, and for Father's Day, I typically give you guys stuff to do, which uh, is a little bit how life works, I think, anyway. I uh, ran across a picture that sort of uh, uh, encapsulates the difference in how we might celebrate Mother's Day and Father's Day, and that's, you know, we, uh, we, we do ge- have a general, at least a general tendency to like, you know, take mom somewhere nice and take dad somewhere that's a little more practical. Uh, now, sometimes I'll say this is self-imposed, because when I, when I worked at a Christian bookstore in Nashville, we had uh, two days out of every year that the, uh, uh, the, the, the leaders of the company would, would take the ladies off uh, for, for a nice lunch and take the guys off for a, for a guy's lunch. And so the ladies would always get dressed up in Sunday finest and, and go off somewhere nice, maybe to like a tea house or, or something, you know, a, a, nice, a nice restaurant. And, the guys, we just wear our work clothes and go do all you can eat catfish at Uncle Bud's. And uh, that's, that's just how it worked out. That's, that's, that's what, uh, what worked out for everybody. But, um, you know, the difference is real. Uh, now, fatherhood goes along with marriage, and marriage, of course, is interesting because men and women are different, right? We, we look at things differently, we, we do different things, we think differently, we feel things differently. And sometimes that leads to interesting interactions, you know, kind of like, um, I don't know how many guys can, can, you know, agree with this, but, you know, sometimes you, you do something that you think is, is intelligent, and your wife says, why did you do that? <laughs> uh, did I marry you, or did I give birth to you? <laughs> it's like what one of our children would do. And of course, you know, I say you guys, because I would never do anything like that. <laughs> And by never, I mean like daily. So we're going to take a little bit of time this morning to talk about these misunderstood geniuses that we call fathers. <laughs> All right, so fathers, there's some important stuff this morning. What do we do? What are we called to do? And I'm going to give some things here. And at the end, we're, we're really going to kind of tie it into everybody because some of the things that I'm, I'm saying specifically to fathers do have that focus. But in a more generalized way, it really could apply to anybody, okay? So, but fathers particularly, we are called to imitate God. We are called to be imitators of God in, I think, a a kind of a special way. Now, in general, this applies to all Christians. We're all called to imitate God. We're all called to imitate Christ. You know, Paul talks about this in the book of Ephesians. But when I look at the role of fathers in the Bible, very often we are given important instructions, to do some of the similar things that God himself does. And so when we look at the Apostle Paul, he gives some important instructions to married people, uh, and he's often criticized for saying, uh, in giving these instructions that women should submit to their husbands, Ephesians 5.22. Those who often uh, get very upset at that sometimes miss that men or husbands are called to do something that may be even more difficult than that. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 to 28. Paul says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without wrinkle, a spot, or wrinkle, or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, in the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. So, we do have passages, wives being called to submit to husbands, and that can be tough because we all have pride and we all have egos. But you look at what husbands are called to do here, especially, and guys, we're called to, we're called to imitate Christ. We are called to have a willingness to sacrifice ourselves, to imitate Christ's selfless desire to see that the object of his affection be so pure 
and so holy and so spotless that she would be fit to be presented to a holy God. That's a tall order. And I'm afraid for a lot of us guys, we may not, we, may, we might be tempted to not take that seriously enough. And there is something here, kind of a safeguard that the Apostle Peter talks about in 1 Peter 3, 7, that helps us kind of understand the importance of this. He says, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Now, for some people in a progressive world, this makes the naughty list of Bible verses because of what Peter says here. However, that does require some explanation because it's not, it's not so much something that's said to women as it is something that's said to men. Now, for some people, I think they, they sort of naturally look at this and say, oh, the woman is the weaker vessel. Well, oh. Well, that means that women have like a second-class status. Well, they're weaker, they're, they're inferior in some way, and that is not what Peter's talking about. Peter's not talking about that. Generally speaking, when we look at this language, as it was used in the ancient world, you know, in the Bible, in other you know, literature in the ancient world, this kind of language was used to refer to physical strength. And so what Peter is saying here is that what we all know to be true it's a it's a fact of biology that men typically are stronger larger denser muscles denser uh, bones big greater lung capacity we enjoy advantages in sporting events and things like that physically maybe a little more resilient but i will say this women can be very tenacious they can be very formidable uh, when i was in high school we had a powder puff football game and the, uh, the quarterback of the high school team uh, played QB for both sides. And apart from all of the other minor injuries that were sustained by the participants in this game, one girl came back with a broken finger and another came back with a broken nose. And the quarterback, he said he'd never played in a game that savage in his life. <laughs> this, was, this was just all like junior and senior girls and they, uh, they went to town. So. Uh, and I don't think that game was ever played again. It was like just one and done. That was it, right? But, uh, but men do enjoy some physical advantages. And I think this is what, what Peter is, is talking about here because when we look at those kinds of advantages, those kinds of things, I think what they become or can become are tools to exploit. They can become tools to exploit other people because Peter's not saying, oh, women are these, these poor pitiful little weaklings and you have to take care of them. The issue is really a, an issue of power. When someone enjoys an advantage, it's human nature to, to use that to lord it over someone else, to exploit someone else, to victimize someone else. And physically, well, financially, you see that in, in our world, that's the financial world, that's, that's very, very true. But physically, you see that. Right? You see people who will intimidate someone else, see someone who will bully someone else. And, we see that in so many atrociously heinous examples of domestic violence. And so Peter here, I think, is saying, yes, men enjoy a, a, an advantage of, of physical strength, but that has to be used appropriately because that does have a, spirit, a bearing on your spiritual life if you abuse that. And so you, you see that, I think, at the end of the verse, when he says, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. And he does this because they're co-heirs in grace, right? so that salvation, co-heirs in salvation with you. Galatians 3 says the same thing from the Apostle Paul. But then he says, you do this so that your prayers may not be hindered. Guys, how we conduct ourselves physically has a bearing on our spiritual nature. And so what Paul is saying here, I mean, what Peter is saying here, rather, is that any man, any man who is abusive, a bully, who uses his strength to intimidate or strong arm his wife into doing what he wants, you can just go ahead and count on God not listening to your prayers. If you're not willing to properly use a gift that God has given you, you will suffer a spiritual consequence. Right, this does not refer to women as second class or inferior. 
This is a warning to men. Now, Christ would never, never behave that way with his church. It should be just as unthinkable to any husband to behave that way with his wife. Now, men are called to imitate Christ, and that's especially true for husbands, and even more so for fathers, because you have extra responsibilities and categories that come along with those things. Now, for men, what we do is we set an example. We set examples for other males. We set examples for our sons, so that they can know what kind of man to be. We set examples for our daughters, what kind of man they should want to marry. The second thing we want to mention here is that godly fathers recognize the importance of spiritual training. All right, so when we talk about fathers imitating Christ, we're talking about the importance for men to recognize the necessity and need of the spiritual. And so regardless of who we are, what physical qualities or attributes or talents or whatever it is that we have, nothing is as important here on earth as that spiritual part of us, that spiritual dimension of our lives. Now, for fathers, there is a physical aspect to it, yes, because you do have verses that talk about fathers providing for their children, or for their families. 1 Timothy 5, 8 talks about this. If anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for the members of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Now, naturally, we say this applies to physical needs, but I think that it also, if we extend it, it applies to spiritual things as well. Fathers would be terrible if we didn't take care of things like food, clothing, shelter. But I think it's appropriate to also include things like education, training for life, training in that spiritual dimension of who we are. And we know that without a father's influence, there are consequences in the lives of children that do crop up. And so we see things like uh, children who don't have the influence of a father. They develop less empathy for other people. Uh, typically, they can be less assertive. They are often more depressed and struggle with depression and mood disorders. They are less obedient, especially as they get older. They have lower self-esteem, and they tend to perform more poorly in school. That's without the influence of a father. Now, you might have a dad, and if you just have a physical dad, then you're just as out of luck with, for, as somebody who doesn't have anything. You have to be a father, guys. You have to have an influence. Not just be a dad at home, not just take care of what's in the bank account or what's on the table or the roof over their heads. We have to take care of the influences in our children's lives, in our family's lives. A father's influence helps to mitigate all of these things. Now, as important as these things are, it's important to be have a good self-esteem, right? It's, it's important to be, you know, assertive in the right way. It's impo- all of these things are, are important to live out our lives in, in this world, but they pale in comparison to the spiritual needs that we have. Our relationship with God supersedes every other relationship on this world, and it means that our children's most important relationship is going to be with their Father in heaven. What are we going to do to help cultivate that relationship so that when they're out of the house and they're having to deal with doubt and temptation, losses or hardships in life, the possibility because of being discriminated against, uh, because they're Christians and their boss or coworkers aren't, how are they going to be equipped? How are they going to be equipped for these uh, almost eventualities in this life? Well, there are all kinds of things that will come up in this lifetime. And we need to be prepared for those things. And, vital, and fathers play a vital role in this. Now, right now, for us as dads, especially when kids are little, right, it's easy to ride to your child's rescue, right? It's easy to help, you know, dismiss their doubts and calm their fears and deal with their worries, especially around the dinner table or at night when we're sitting on, you know, next to them at bed, getting ready to tuck them in. But what happens about that time to that time when they have to stand on their own? What happens at that time when they're no longer in the house, when they're no longer have our eager and open ears to listen to them? What happens when they're out on their own? Will we have prepared them for that? And uh, that isn't just a spiritual preparation for for what they'll deal with in this life. It's also for what 
they will deal with in the life to come. They'll encounter people in this life who will give them trials and challenges. But there is one before whom they will have to stand at judgment. 2 Corinthians 5.10 Paul says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And fathers, or really, uh, you know, we could almost expand this out to any guy who has uh, an influence in the lives of other people. One day, our wives, our kids, others we influence, they're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And I want us to ask ourselves some important questions. Number one, have I done my best to encourage my family to have a closer relationship with God? Have I done my best to help cultivate that in their lives? If not, maybe that's something we need to look at. Number two, have I been the kind of helpmeet who has encouraged my wife to meet her goals in being a faithful spouse, a godly mother, and a sister in Christ? If we've not had as much influence as we should in this area, we need to take a look at that. Number three, have I prepared my children for the spiritual challenges that they will face in this life? And they will. That will come. Are they ready for it? And number four, have I warded off spiritual dangers and encouraged my family to live a life of righteousness, holiness, and service? When the devil comes around, and he will, can you say to him, you can have my family over my dead body? It's a little bit like what Jesus did on the cross, isn't it? Speaking of how fathers imitate God. Well, the title of our lesson this morning is The Blessing of Fatherhood. And I've talked a lot about what guys are supposed to be doing, right? And that was intentional because in one way, yes, it's a blessing to be a father, to, to have children, right? To have those, those little ones that you get to have the responsibility of influencing. But being a father isn't just about being privileged and getting to lead people and having people follow us. It's not so much about getting blessings. It's also about being a blessing, giving blessings to other people. And that's something that fathers do in a special way. But to be honest, anyone who is a Christian, this is something that we all do. We could really ask any one of these questions, in a, maybe a slightly modified form. We could ask any single one of these questions of anyone, not just of fathers, but of any Christian. Well, as we are looking at our lives, do we encourage other people? Do we encourage them in the spiritual? Are we being helpful? Are we helping to prepare those who may not be as spiritually mature as we are? Because when we're doing these things, I mean, you have to realize, and, and when you do them, you understand there's a joy to this. There's a joy to seeing that in someone else's life, to watching them grow, to watching them mature in the faith. There it is, and it, it's a joy that we get to experience. And so, really, in a way, this is for anyone, not just fathers, but mothers, and husbands, and wives, and anyone who's a mentor or just a good influence to our fellow Christians. The Christian life is the most challenging life you'll ever love. And there are responsibilities to that. There are obligations that we have. But fulfilling those will lead to a life of joy that cannot be equaled by anything here on this earth. Nothing else will bring you the peace and satisfaction that you will have in Christ. With that having been said, we want to ask if there's anyone here today who needs to be baptized into Christ. Maybe you need to put on Christ for the first time. And if that's the case, this is your opportunity to do that. We would love to see you step forward and, and make that commitment to him, putting your faith and trust in him and his work on the cross and, and renouncing sin and being baptized, being immersed for the forgiveness of those sins. We would love to see that. But maybe you're uh, someone who is a bit more of a private individual and you may not want to respond in front of everyone. But we do want to encourage you to respond privately if you don't respond publicly. I'll be honest, that's what I did. 
When I was baptized, there was only three people there, and I was one of them. There's nothing wrong with that, right? But if you do choose to respond, hey, you're going to have an entire auditorium filled with people who rejoice at the birth of a new brother or sister in Christ. But if you want to do it privately, that's okay too. Now, there may be someone who needs to come back to Christ after some time away, and if that's the case, hey, there's no better time than right now. And you may just have something that you want to ask that for the congregation to pray for. And we'd love to pray with you or for you. Whatever it is that you have, we want you to let us know while we stand and sing.
church. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Fathers, we approach your throne this morning. We're so thankful for the blessings that you bestow upon us. We're thankful for the lesson that Brother Brian brought for us this morning, dear Father, and help us to implement what he talked about this morning, dear Father. Help us to be an example, not a warning, dear Father, not just to our family, but for those around us as well. Dear Father, our family unit is under attack. We just pray for the, the, the wives, the husbands, dear Father. Anything that they're going and they're dealing with, dear Father, they, they lean on the rock, the foundation that you have built, dear Father, for us. And for the single mothers and the single fathers as well, dear Father, may we continue to encourage them and bless them. They wear multiple hats, dual hats, dear Father. We just say a, say a special prayer on their behalf as well. Dear Father, we know that there are things going on in our world that are not under our control, dear Father. And we know that you are in control, dear Father. As we leave this place, help us to be mindful of the people that are dealing with persecution, that are dealing with illnesses, dear Father, physical, mental. Help us, dear Father, to encourage them for us to wrap our hands around them, dear Father. Help us to get away from the distractions, dear Father, that keep us away from being the brothers and sisters that we should be, dear Father. Dear Father, as we celebrate this Juneteenth, we want to pray, dear Father, for all the men and women that have gone before us, that have laid and blazed the trail, dear Father, for us to celebrate the freedoms that we have had and may share today. Dear Father, once again, we're thankful for your Son and our Savior, Jesus the Christ, for the sacrifice that was made by him on that cruel cross of Calvary, dear Father. Help us, dear Father, to take it. Uh, as we enter the mission field, as we leave this place and enter the mission field, dear Father, help us to help our light shine. Help us to hold our light, dear Father, without any fear uh, or anything of that nature, dear Father. Help us to not be timid. We don't pray, dear Father, for our situations to be easier. We pray that, dear Father, that you make us stronger. Dear Father, help us to be the light that this, this world so desperately needs. We pray for all the men and women that are dealing with things, dear Father. We pray for our brothers and sisters that couldn't be here this morning. All of those that are dealing with the loss of loved ones, dear Father, may you encourage them as only you can. Dear Father, once again, as we leave this place, we thank you for, the, the, for what you do for us, for our health, for the financial blessings that you have blessed us with, for our family, and all the means and, and things that we sometimes forget about and take for granted. Help us to be better stewards, not just with our time, not just with our money. Dear Father, help us to love one another despite all the things going on. We pray all these blessings in your son's most holy name. Amen.